Jesus said, Happy are people who make peace, because they will be called God's children. Welcome to this service of worship. We are glad that you're with us. We have a few community notes that we want to make sure you're aware of as you move through the week and continue in worship. But in this moment, let us together um, further prepare for worship, making use of the questions that are before you. God deserves our trust to calm storms, but we have trouble with that. It's important to admit when we're wrong so that we're ready to hear what God has to say. So let us begin 
with silent prayer. Holy God, your Spirit moved over the chaotic waters and brought creation. Your Spirit parted the waters and rescued a nation from the chaos of slavery through the Red Sea. You formed a people of God through the waters of the Jordan and the chaos of war. You reassured the nation through the chaos of exile and taught them that they are the promised land instead. That they are the promised land instead. You sent Jesus into a world of chaos to tell us our storms will not have the last word. You show up again and again and again through the storms we have all come to know, showing us you are still with us. But for all of that history, we still hold your promises with suspicion and fail to trust you as we should. Forgive us, great God. Help us do better. Gratefully, we pray this. Thank you for listening, God. Amen. So how do you know what you know? How do you know what you actually believe? Is it just what you grew up with? Is it just what you were taught in school or at home? Is it a, a matter of what you feel or what you figure out? Um, is it a question of common sense or tradition? Maybe what we know is simply experience. Maybe it is trial and error. You know, however you shake it, okay? What we know boils down to one word, trust. Who do we trust? What do we trust? Why do we trust? In what basket do we place our trust eggs? I mean, I can be shown all the scripture there is, but if I don't trust it, what does it really mean to me? I can trust all the evidence that you show me, all the scientific data in the world, but if I don't trust it, it's all just background noise. If you can tell me you love me, but I don't trust you, I mean, your word in my hearing it is meaningless. That, y'all, is why it matters in whom we put our faith. Anytime we're confronted with a task or belief or decision, we have to ask, can I trust? Can I trust what I'm hearing? Can I trust what I'm seeing? Can I trust what I'm feeling? I mean, think of how much would come to a screeching halt without trust. We sit in a new, uh, we sit in a pew or in chairs without thinking a lot about it, and we trust them to hold us up. We get into a public pool or even a neighbor's pool, assuming that they've gotten the cleaning chemicals right. We we go to the restaurant and we trust what the health rating tells us if we bother to even look for it, right? 
I mean, we assume and presume a lot because we trust our own ability to tell whether or not we're being fooled. At least we think so. Take a moment, okay, and look at these origin stories for the song, Jesus Loves Me, and try and figure out which one is the original, true origin story. Is it number one, or is it number two? Well, which is it? I mean, did Anna write the hymn for her sister's book, or did she write the hymn based on her sister's book? In other words, did she take an excerpt from it and from that create the hymn, or did she write the hymn because her sister wanted to include it in her book? I mean, any way that you try to answer that question, right, hinges on who or what we decide we trust to mitigate the answer for us. In other words, we have to decide, and we do so based on trust, just like everything else. I mean, that's one of the parts of our human experience that makes the story um, for, for this weekend so crazy. I mean, at several points, both the disciples and Jesus had decisions of trust to make. And the ability to experience real peace, even in the face of chaos, hung in the balance. This is the gospel according to Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41, the calming of the storm. Listen for the word of God to us all and for our place in God's story. Later that day, when evening came, Jesus said to them, Let's cross over to the other side of the lake. They left the crowd and took him in the boat, just as he was. Other boats followed along. Gale force winds arose and waves crashed against the boat so that the boat was swamped. But Jesus was in the rear of the boat, sleeping on a pillow. They woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you care that we're drowning? He got up and gave orders to the wind, and he said to the lake, Silence! Be still! The wind settled down, and there was a great calm. Jesus asked them, Why are you frightened? Don't you have faith yet? Overcome with awe, they said to each other, Who, is, who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So there they are. The waters of the Sea of Galilee are fairly serene until they're not. I mean, storms can form quickly and the waters can become suddenly choppy and treacherous. And being in a fishing boat back in the day wouldn't have helped a lot. That boat um, would have been shallow and not designed for roughing it in stormy waters. I mean, it was made to make it um, to handle, you know, nets of fish. I mean, it had to be easy to get in and out of. Think John boat, if you will, okay? Um, but, but don't forget about how this started. It was Jesus' idea for them to cross the lake. And now they're getting swamped. That is, water is pouring into the boat, guaranteeing that they'll sink. And we have no idea how far out they were, but rough waters are a challenge even for an experienced swimmer. So they're panicking. They're panicking. And, and we don't know how long they struggled with the situation before they decided to wake Jesus up. 
I mean, did they have buckets? Was the water coming in faster than they could dump it out? Was there lightning? Was there rain? We don't know. All we know from the story is that the wind was up, the water was nuts, and Jesus was clearly exhausted and sleeping through it. Sleeping through it. And somehow the disciples read that as Jesus not caring. I mean, why would they say that? Probably because they were looking through the lens of their own experience. Maybe over the years they developed a strong distrust of the weather that made it so that they didn't sleep well on the boat. I mean, I know for myself that I will wake up in the wee hours and find myself, my mind, racing and find it impossible to go back to sleep. And maybe I'm worried about things. Maybe I'm worried about my congregation. Maybe I'm worried about our housing situation. Um, Maybe I'm worried about how our girls are doing in college. Worried about how to make ends meet. Worried about everyone's health challenges. Worried about the handbasket our world seems to be traveling in. Worried about respect or faithfulness or trying to keep people happy. I mean, when I think of all those things together, it sounds a lot like a storm to me. It sounds a lot like chaos. Chaos, like the waters that God's Spirit moved over before creating everything. You know, like, like the Red Sea waters that parted for a nation. Exercises of God's authority and power that are meant to remind us of life's true pecking order. The question is, do we trust that God is really in charge? You see, I don't think Jesus was asleep because he was trying to teach the disciples a lesson or he was ignoring their fear. I think Jesus was able to sleep because he trusted God had everything in hand. Whatever might happen. I mean, that's a tall order for generations of human beings who've been taught culturally to be control freaks. And in our efforts to control, we come to a critical test of our will. Should we really trust ourselves more than God? I think the reason that we find ourselves afraid and unsure in a place where confusion drives a train where anxiousness reigns is because we trust ourselves more than God. Our pursuits of peace, real peace, are useless, y'all. Useless unless we put God first. Thus, Jesus' question is not um, admonishment or, or making fun of the disciples. It is the only question. Why are you frightened? Don't you have faith yet? Real peace means making room for God to calm storms. And whether it's the natural disasters or human-made disasters we experience, whether it's the storms caused by our actions or inactions, whether it's the wildfires started by our words or silence, God means for us to have peace. And we can trust God to come through with it. Even if we don't have faith yet. Thanks be to God. Amen.
God chooses to bless us abundantly. We should respond by choosing to be blessings abundantly. This is why we should give and share what we have and who we are um, at, at any and all times and at every opportunity, really. And so let us reflect together on what has been given, including us. Let us pray together. Let there be no doubt, great God, You bless us, and we are grateful. Let there be no doubt, great God, we should be blessings in turn. As we receive the gifts you provide, may the gifts we are meant to be emerge. In the great name of Jesus Christ, we pray this together. Amen. As we pray together, there will be an opportunity for you to lift up your personal prayers. Um, This opportunity will be obvious, and we encourage you to make use of it, even if it means you have to pause the video for more time. And in this way, we together will pray the prayers of the people. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray together. Come, bring your burdens to God. Come, bring your burdens to God. Come, bring your burdens to God. For Jesus will never say no. Lord God, you say yes to us. With every sunrise, with every breath, with the light that awakens in us whenever we greet the day, remember something good, achieve something, you demonstrate how much you care about us. It's got to be frustrating then when we get all of that affirmation from you and then ignore your pleas with us for peace. Help us make room for the peace you are seeking to author for us and in us. Help us trust you as we should. Help us stop making you a second thought to our own plans and abilities. Help us stop making you a second thought to our own experience and feelings. Help us stop making you a second thought to our trust in our judgment, knowledge, or even belief. And learn well to put you first, great God. Thus, let us be spirit-filled people. Let us set aside safety and embrace risk-taking with you. May your healing balm reach through us to those around us, especially those on our prayer lists and those we will come to know. Despite our collective answer of violence, of disdain, of division, of cynicism to your love, may we truly be washed by you and embrace hope instead. For this reason, with great confidence and at your invitation, we take this time to lift up to you our personal prayers. Thank you for believing in us. Thank you for transforming us. Thank you for the giving of the Holy Spirit to each of us. Thank you for teaching us even how to pray when words fail us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. Let us together say our benediction. Real peace means making room for God to calm storms. Get up. Take heart. Jesus is still calling you. And as you go, may the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and minds this weekend and forevermore. Amen. Go now in peace, go now in peace. May the love of God surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go. Go now in peace, go now in peace. May the love of God surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go. As we mentioned, we have a few um, community notes that we want to make sure you are aware of as we continue in worship throughout the week, beginning with the idea that um, our storms will not have the last word, only God. I mean, we experience all kinds of storms. We've spent the whole of the summer experiencing nature's power in all places around the world, but we also experience storms within, fights, conflicts, we struggle against and with others, in ourselves, with our paths, with uncertainty. But God has authority over it all. This week, take an inventory of the storms in your life and pray for God's peace over them. Look for ways you can be a peacemaker in the midst of them, both for yourself and for those around you. We also encourage you to um, continue with us as we um, dive right into the Follow Me um, Bible Study series. And in this particular case, Make Peace is the theme that we'll be into for the next several weeks. We encourage you to get the study materials, which are available from our church website, from our Facebook page, as well as you can get it from the church office. Just reach out to us. And in particular, you can reach out to our church educator, Mandy Ely, for more information. We also want to make sure you're aware that Community Day is here. It is all hands on deck for next Saturday, September the 23rd. Um, we are looking for a fantastic event and we can use help setting it up, making it happen, hosting our guests, and cleaning up. Between the music, the food, the health clinic, the raffle, the crafts, and most importantly, the fellowship with the wider community, we have a chance here to showcase who we are. So let's show them. And thank you for all of your efforts. <laughs>